in the spirit of going green this year in ecology, our next speaker is going to talk about sustainability a bit. So please give a warm welcome to Sohan. Check, check, one, two. Hello, folks. Good morning. My name is Sohan Maheshwar. Uh, I'm a dev advocate at Amazon Web Services. And um, this is my first time in Serbia and in Belgrade. So I'm super excited to be here. Uh, unfortunately, I might have to start with some bad news. And that is, scientists say that there's limited time to actually reduce global warming um, to this window uh, and reduce it to 1.5 degrees by 2050. And I'm sure all of y'all are familiar with the climate crisis, uh, about a move to be a little more sustainable. And, you know, and I, I think everyone here is conscious about being a little more sustainable in their daily lives. Here's the thing. Um, software and technology is really at the heart of everything that we do. Right? And so here today, I'm going to talk about your sustainability journey uh, in technology, uh, mostly via the cloud. Right? So, when I use the word sustainability journey, uh, it's important to first understand some terminology, right? And I think we start with what really is your carbon footprint when you deploy some code, you know? So say you work in a huge bank and you have this global impact of technology and customers around the world, what is the carbon footprint of those workloads itself? And how do you take a look at it? Once you understand that, I'm going to talk about some tips on how you can actually architect your workloads for sustainability. Uh, this might seem like a little strange saying, hey, how does my code and my architecture actually affect sustainability? Well, that's what I'm here to talk about. And finally, we'll talk a bit about sustainability transformation. This does sound like a buzzword, but it is something that exists, so we'll talk about it. Now, there is an obvious environmental impact to being more sustainable. I think we all know that. But here's the interesting part. Uh, there is a driver for business growth as well. So if you work in a company and you're like, okay, sure, I love the environment, but so what? You know, but there's a very real business impact as well. Uh, in this report by Accenture, they actually said that companies at this twin intersection of technology and sustainability are seeing more growth. So as a business, we are also seeing employees and customers demand that businesses be a little more sustainable. So you know, there is a very real business value as well. All right, so let's get into the terminology. Uh, the GHG, or the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, defines how to convert greenhouse gases to a carbon dioxide equivalent and three scopes of carbon footprint. Now, the question that I get asked most is, how do you calculate what carbon footprint of a workload is? So we have to start at the very beginning, right? And there are three different scopes of how you can calculate this. Scope number one, I think, is fairly straightforward. It is the fuel consumed by something, right? So whoever essentially owns the fuel when it burns is scope one. So in a car, when you're burning some fuel, when you're driving somewhere, that is a scope one. When you're cooking, you're using some oil, that is scope one. And same way in a data center, you might use a generator, so that could be a scope one emission. If you electrify all of this, you're reducing that scope one to zero. There's scope two, which is energy used. And this includes things like electricity, renewables, uh, windmills, power station, grids, and so on. Uh, there is a real move uh, worldwide to really move to these sort of energy sources. And any electricity use is counted only once when it is consumed. So these are some of the other numbers that go into scope two. And scope three is everything else. So depending on the nature of your business, if you have a supply chain, investments, inventory, consumers, all of the energy consumed there counts to scope three. Now, in the last 10 years or so, we have moved from a typical data center to moving things to the cloud. And if you take these scopes to a good old data center, this is sort of what it looks like, right? So this is the carbon footprint of a data center. Yes, this is quite a fancy slide. But you can see there is a scope one where you have backup generators where you're actually burning fuel. Typically, you have scope two that powers these generators. You have wind farms, you have different electricity sources. And of course, you could have scope three where 
transportation is bringing racks of servers, stacking them up, that sort of thing. Right? In the cloud, when you move, uh, some of these things change completely. And anyone here uses the cloud? Just quick raise of hands. Well, almost everyone. Well, congratulations, because just by using a cloud itself, you are immediately more sustainable than a typical data center. Now, this is because of how the cloud is structured. In a cloud, first, there is huge scale. Uh, there is also very high levels of utilization. There's dynamic resource sharing as well, so multiple customers could use the same piece of hardware. In fact, in a study, uh, they showed that you get at least 80% reduction of energy when you shift to an AWS cloud compared to a data center. Right? And that could go up to 96% if uh, the AWS uses 100% renewable energy in that data center. So first step, if you're using the cloud, congratulations. Already more sustainable. But here, I'm here to talk to you about how you can further be sustainable. OK, so let's go into something a little more specific to AWS or Amazon Web Services. Anyone here is familiar with the shared responsibility model of AWS? Anyone? Few of you are? OK, excellent. Quick explanation. When it comes to things like security and compliance, there is a shared responsibility between AWS, us, and the customers using it. So we take care of security you know, of the cloud. So like physical security, uh, everything around that, and you take care of the things that are in the cloud itself, and we give you the tools and services to do that. With sustainability, we see a similar sort of relationship, right? So the customer is responsible for sustainability in the cloud. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. And AWS is responsible for sustainability of the cloud itself. So we will take care of the servers, of the cooling, of the waste management, of the water recycling, all of that. You know, and we regularly, regularly uh, release reports on this as well. So you can see all of this data online. So I'm going to have one slide on this, and then we'll go on to the little more fun stuff. So when it comes to sustainability of the cloud, Amazon is committed to this. Uh, we have a commitment to run on 100% renewable energy by 2025 and be uh, carbon net zero by the year 2040. Right? So we take care of everything like water stewardship, you know, having recycled water, treatment of water. Um, we have renewable energy sources that actually power our data centers. And for the builders here, this, I think, is super interesting. It's called the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative. Right? So it's a bunch of data sets that are open and available to anyone for free. Uh, includes things like weather reports, um, wind data, just super interesting data to do with sustainability. And you can actually build on top of that. Right? So it's all on GitHub. Look it up. You can build interesting models. Just a lot of cool things you can do with that. So let's talk about sustainability in the cloud itself, right? How you can actually deploy something on the cloud and then look at metrics to see what levels of sustainability um, you all have. If I have to define it, I'm going to define it this way, which is sustainability in the cloud is a continuous focused effort on energy reduction and efficiency across all components of a workload. Now, I've highlighted a couple of words there, but for me, the key word is the continuous bit, right? Because very often, I've seen uh, or I've spoken to customers who might do this, say, once. Right? They're like, hey, let's be sustainable. This is sustainability month. Let's do it once, and then let's forget about it, right? And that isn't being sustainable. It's about having this continuous effort. So today, I'm going to talk to you about some of these best practices in the focus lenses of things like region selection, user behavior, and so on. So let's start with region selection. And those of you all using AWS will know that there are AWS regions, like there's EU West 1 or US East 1, which are physical locations where there are a cluster of data centers. Now, typically, people choose regions based on where their customers are. Sometimes you might work in a financial institution where you know, there is uh, a data residency requirement. Your data has to be in this country. But if you don't have it, you know, such constraints, you can actually choose regions which are more energy efficient. 
Again, all of this is calculated through those metrics I told you earlier of scope one, scope two, scope three. So choosing a region in Europe, for instance, is up to five times more efficient, or same with Asia Pacific. So if your requirements don't need it, you could actually just literally choose a region that is a little more energy efficient for you. That's the easy bit. So let's go on to user behavior patterns, right? And this basically means getting an insight into how your users use your workload. So uh, when they use it, what resources are not being used, uh, when it scales, and so on. So let me give you a good example. Right? So let's talk about if you want to optimize your capacity for sustainability. So say the requirement of your workload is immediate failover. Right? So if something happens, you immediately want your workload up and running with no impact to your users. A common design pattern we have seen is people have an availability zone A, right? And they have something running, and they have the same thing running in a different availability zone B. Now, if A goes down, that workload is entirely moved to B with no impact to your users, right? And this is a common pattern that we see, but here's the problem with this. The utilization is actually fairly bad because 50% of this workload is not being utilized, 50% of this workload is not being utilized, right? So you're actually paying for a bunch and your carbon footprint is higher. What you could potentially do is actually add another availability zones with, instead of running at 50%, run each of them at 66%, right? Up to two thirds. So if this availability zone goes down, you split it between the other two availability zones. So that way your utilization is really good even before something happens and if something happens as well. Similarly, maybe you want to optimize resiliency for sustainability, but your requirement is there's no need for an immediate failover. Maybe this workload is not mission critical. So you can use something called cold capacity where you keep capacity running as cold, it's not warm, and you have utilization at 100%. So if this goes out, you just switch it to a new availability zone, thereby you have 100% utilization. It will take time for this because it is cold capacity, but then again, we know that the requirement doesn't need for an immediate failover. These two examples highlight something, which is all of this depends on your service level agreements with your customers, right? So when you're having that conversation, try and negotiate service level agreements that are impact friendly. Sometimes it, they don't have to be uh, up and running immediately, right? So try and get these metrics and speak to your customers beforehand. And a good side effect of this is it might even reduce your cost. Yeah, so you might reduce your cost in the cloud and you know, reduce your carbon footprint as well. Let's talk about software patterns, right? And how you can manage different components and especially the data that you use. <laughs> here's, here's an interesting uh, example that I came across. So when we're provisioning capacity in the cloud, what, what eventually ends up happening is we're actually provisioning for the peaks, right? You're like, hey, on Saturday, a lot of people use my app and it goes up. So I'm going to provision capacity much higher just in case, you know, my app goes viral or whatever. And what ends up happening is we are actually provisioning for these peaks and not your average usage. If you can find ways to reduce these peaks, your provision capacity immediately comes down as well. And again, you're reducing your carbon footprint and you're saving cost. So how do you actually do this? Well, there are a few ways you could do it. Uh, quick question, does anyone know what this is? You might have seen this design pattern. Uh, no, no one? Okay. Uh, this is a cron tab or a cron job. You know? uh, companies run this as a scheduler, like let's run this process at midnight. You know? Great. But here's the thing, everyone's doing the exact same thing. Everyone's running it at midnight, right? So that actually drives up peak workloads in the cloud. Yeah? And everyone just by default chooses midnight to run these cron jobs. And imagine hundreds of thousands of customers doing this. So you could actually you know, um, change that time around so that those peaks are actually reduced. Another very interesting way to reduce these peaks is the usage of queues and buffers. Right? Uh, I've had conversations with customers where 
I go and tell them, hey, look, you, you can have the exact same metrics if you just use cues and buffers, and it's like a light bulb moment that goes off in their head. You know, I, I think the analogy is if you, in a city where there's a lot of traffic, I'm originally from this city called Bangalore in South India, worst traffic in the world, right? And you will see people who will really drive fast on every road, stop at every signal, drive fast again, and someone who drives at a constant pace and they reach the destination at the same time, right? That's the sort of analogy I want to draw here. When you're using things like queues and buffers, you can actually have no impact on eventual usage, but you drive down your peaks, which means provision capacity also is low, and you're saving money and uh, reducing your carbon footprint. All right, let's talk about hardware. We spoke about software and user behavior. Let's talk about choosing hardware in the cloud. If you've been following um, a lot of news about the cloud, you would have noticed that there are more and more chips that are being launched that are purpose-built. Right? So, for instance, for AI ML, artificial intelligence machine learning workloads, you have purpose-built chips. Or if you're running something that's graphics in intensive, you have purpose-built chips. And using that immediately means you're being more efficient. Uh, at Amazon, we launched something called Graviton, which is a chip that we have custom designed. Uh, last year, no, wait, this year, we launched Graviton 3, right? And these are 64-bit ARM processors, and they're optimized for cloud-native workloads. So just by choosing the right chip, you can have up to 60% savings in energy because of the way these chips are automatically designed. Same way if you're doing AI ML, uh, the inferentia chips are what you should be using, again, because they are purpose-built. And yeah, just it's an easy switch to move to any of these chips, literally, uh, especially if you're using high-level programming languages, you don't even have to recompile the code. You just um, shift to a Graviton 2 or Graviton 3, and you, know, you have all these cost and energy savings. Data. I, I think there are so many conversations about the amount of data that every organization and business is actually generating, right? But I don't think there are enough conversations about how to efficiently store or process this data. Yeah? Uh, very simple things could actually have a huge impact downstream uh, on both costs, and your carbon footprint. Just to give you an example, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Amazon S3, storage service. You can have things like lifecycle rules. So when an object goes into an S3 bucket, after a certain number of days of no one using that, it could be moved to something like a deep archive. Right? And in a deep archive, it sits there. It's, it's still there. You can still retrieve it. It just takes longer for retrieval. Right? It's meant for archiving. And you could add that same rule in your deep archive to delete, maybe, say, after a year. You don't need that data anymore. In S3, in fact, uh, we actually have these different uh, ways of classifying data, right? So hot data, which is data that's accessed very often, can be used in S3 standard, right? Where you have millisecond access, multiple availability zones. But data that's inactive could be in one zone. The IA stands for infrequent access. So you still have millisecond access, but in one availability zones. And some archival data can be in your glacier, right? Where it may take a few hours to access, but you don't need to access it very often. Again, what happens is you're reducing your carbon footprint because that data is hot, so it needs to be there. Whereas this data, you can you know, maybe access it once a year or whenever. Again, also look beyond the standard data formats. Again, there are different data formats like Parkway, Orc, and Arvo, which are meant for large amounts of data. And also look for purpose-built databases. You know, it's not like one size database fits all. So for instance, if you're streaming millions of IoT events, look at a time series database. You know, it doesn't have to fit into a typical relational database, for instance. This, this, is a, this is a very interesting example. Any workload generates a lot of logs, right? You want observability into what's happening, log events. And we have a large amount of logs that are stored and archived on S3. Just by switching the compression algorithm to ZSTD or Z standard, we actually reduce storage by one exabyte. Do you know how many zeros are there in one exabyte? That's 18 zeros. Right? So that is a lot of storage just by switching a compression standard. Again, things that 
we and businesses might not necessarily look at as a first thing to do because, well, all of us are busy building great products, but can actually make a very big difference. And lastly, the entire process of development and deployment itself. Now, taking an example from AWS, we have an SDK for JavaScript. And that SDK grew and grew to about 4.17 MB as an install file size. So when you access it on the web, it was actually being used. So when we switched from version 2 to version 3, we actually made it modular so that people could just choose the services that they want. And that reduced the build and publish size to 536 KB. Right? So that's an immediate uh, impact right there. And we reduced our bundle size by about 75% by just paying attention to our build artifact size. So again, when I'm sure in your dev processes you have these build artifacts created, see how you can actually reduce that as well. Now, all of what I said so far, right? all of these tips would be completely useless if they weren't part of your processes. Right? If this was something you all did once and then completely forgot about it, it's not going to have that much impact. Yeah? So how do you bring this into your people, into your processes, and into your technology? At Amazon, we have this thing called the well-architected review. Right? It's, it's there on our cloud. Uh, it's essentially to see if uh, your cloud workload is well architected or not through the lens of things like security, resilience, and cost optimization. And typically, that happens just before you go into production. We just recently launched the sustainability pillar to the well-architected review. But here's the thing. You want to left shift that into every stage of your dev process. You, know, you don't want to do it only in production, but you actually want to start and you know, build this into each and every process from the beginning. Right? So you want to think about sustainability right from the design stage of your product. And honestly, if we don't look at it from an angle of metrics, then it's completely pointless. Right? How many of you here do like daily stand-ups, weekly stand-ups, monthly meetings? Everyone, all of us do that. Right? But now, how many of you all talk about sustainability in each of these? I'm guessing not too many. And the reason is it's not built into the metrics that we look at typically. Right? We might look at functional requirements like storage, utilization, data transfer, compute. These are some requirements that we look at when we talk about metrics. And these can be against each other. For instance, do you want to store all your data in every region? Or do you want to increase data transfer between regions? Similarly, do you want to store and cache more data on your users' devices? Or do you want to compute it every time? And these are some conversations you might have. The non-functional requirements and sustainability is going to be one of them. right? And again, they will work against some of your resources. right? For instance, cost versus compute. You know, do you want to get your users to compute everything on their devices, or do you want to do the computation on the cloud and save your users from upgrading their mobile phones every year? So sustainability is a non-functional requirement that way. That should definitely be part of your metrics and processes going forward. One good way to think about that is don't just look at resources. Right? Don't just look at, oh, these are the number of resources we're consuming. Look at resources divided by the unit of work. So just to give you an example, don't look at, oh, we have 100 virtual CPUs running, but think of 100 virtual CPUs per connected mile of our fleet of taxis. Right? So that will give you a very accurate representation of how your resources are being consumed in accordance with scale. Quick uh, shout out for AWS itself. You can, we launched this uh, in reInvent last year, and it's uh, in general availability this year, which is the customer carbon footprint tool. So you get detailed metrics about your carbon footprint usage based on region, based on service, um, you know, and you get um, other tips on how you could reduce your carbon footprint too. So this is a way for you to actually track your metrics uh, with your carbon footprint with all of the tips that I spoke about earlier. Like I said, it's very important for this to be part of your reporting and your metrics, right? So try and find fine-grained KPIs that your team can own. 
Um, of course, you can build entire dashboards using AWS itself, where you can have the data stored in S3, you can process that data using Athena, and build dashboards using QuickSight. And I think it's vital for everyone in the team to sort of own these sustainability goals. It's not just a CEO or like a tech lead who does this, but uh, someone like an architect or a dev can actually design and code for sustainability. A DevOps person could optimize for efficiency, whereas a senior leader is actually reporting this carbon data to customers and to leadership. Like I mentioned before, there is the well-architected uh, sustainability pillar that we just announced last year. So if you want to evaluate your workload, just check this out. You get a series of questions that you have to answer, and you get responses on what you can do to actually improve these processes. Quick summary of what I just spoke about. I think we all can do our part. Right? Uh, and regardless of what your role is within an org, we all can think about building sustainability into what we do. And understand that it is a journey. You're not flipping a switch and immediately becoming more sustainable. It is a journey. Right? And to be on that journey, understand the terminology, understand how you can lower your carbon footprint. Look at all the lenses that I spoke about earlier and the sustainability pillar of the well-architected review. And of course, make sure you have KPIs, you report these KPIs, you have metrics, and you see changes in those metrics. For next steps, right? Um, I think we've spent the last decade speaking about this term digital transformation. Right? All of us are like, oh, digital transformation, move to the cloud, transform. And most of us, I think, are on the end of that journey. We are all digitally, digitally transformed. We are in the 2020s. Uh, this decade is going to be more about sustainability transformation, right? where there is this demand, and it's high time we do it. So we all have to get onto that journey as well. I look around in the room, and I see a lot of young folks. And um, I think the reason I do this talk is just to bring awareness. Right? So for next steps, really, it's only about speaking about this, right? Uh, speak about this on your social media, speak about this in your team. Start that conversation now, because it's important to do so, uh, and to bring it into consciousness. Because like I said, technology is at the heart of everything that we do. And now we have to start taking sustainability seriously, and especially sustainability in technology. Anyway, hope you learned something new, and I hope this sparked some conversation. I'm around for a bit, so feel free to connect. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.